Hello, this is Miles, and this is Basis 96, and we have a delightful abductee contactee called Sev Talk. Is that correct? Yes. Welcome, Sev. A delight. You. And you're from southern, southern Florida at the moment? No, right now I am on the inner banks of North Carolina. Carolina. That's a little bit north of Florida. Mm-hmm. So... Um, and we have a PowerPoint presentation here, which we've managed to assemble at amazing speed. And um, it's a wonderful photograph. We've got that. And you've got some important things to to, um, to have on that. I mean, this is quite serious, this. So, Sev, what brings a obviously very civilized and very intelligent person like yourself talking about aliens? What do you feel about that? What do you feel about even me saying it that way? Uh, it brings up, uh, it brings up a lot of emotion, uh, because I've been hiding my ET contact for 45 years. Uh, I have, uh, my earliest memories are from when I was age 10. And the second night that we moved here to North Carolina, I came in contact with the Greys and they left two red X marks on my back. And that was in September 2017. And that changed my life. It was at that moment that I realized I can't hide anymore. I need to figure out what's going on. Uh, this is a, a, a big fear of mine that I've been hiding, and I need to come to it. I need to face it. I need to move through this roadblock because... I've been on this path of authenticity. I believe that when you express the most authentic version of yourself, you are the most fulfilled and the happiest and at the most peaceful. And so that's what I was doing. I was on the path of authenticity, and I did not know that my path of authenticity was going to include the ETs. And so I had to deal with it, and I had to come face to face with it. And uh, so it hasn't been going on for very long. The book that I wrote uh, came out last August. And when I spoke at AlienCon in Baltimore, that was just six months ago. So everything is moving along at a very fast pace. Uh, a lot of realizations are coming to me. A lot of doors are opening. Uh, I feel like I'm going deeper and deeper and deeper into some kind of rabbit hole. I'm getting answers and at the same time, I, there's a lot more questions. And I am so grateful that we've met, Miles. I really, truly believe that you're in my life to help me understand what's happening because it keeps getting weirder and weirder. Well, just while you were speaking there, I took the opportunity to, A, uh, show that X mark that you had that you sent me, uh, and also uh, you have the right to talk to aliens, the book. You. And you've got quite a few things there that you're doing um, so do you want to just go back to really who you are and um, and really how, how that translates to the to what your circumstances are now? Oh, all right. Uh, so that people have an idea of, of what sort of things are, what you're about, and where you're coming from. Okay. Uh, for the past nine or 10 years or so, I've had my own practice as a spiritual counselor. And I do intuitive readings, and I help people discover their purpose and how to fulfill it. Uh, and before that, I had uh, several other businesses, and I was just going from job to job, business to business, just trying to find myself. Uh, while all of this ET stuff was happening, and while I was all just trying to ignore it. Uh, I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, where my family's from, 99% of my family is still there. And my parents and I emigrated to Canada, to Montreal, where my sister was born, and then we came into the States. Uh, despite my parents coming from a Muslim country, they were not Muslim, and I was not raised as Muslim. And from a very early age, we, we were uh, taught that uh, we have a soul, and there is more to us than just this physical body, and you can do astral travel, and there's different dimensions. And I, I mean, that's a big deal. I'm very grateful. That not everybody. At what age were you taught all that? That's huge. Elementary school, fifth grade. It started in fifth grade. So my parents are before their time, and my parents' friends made fun of them. 
Uh, we were buying bottled water back when I was in fifth grade and everyone was making fun of them and the vitamins we were taking and for their beliefs. And I would play uh, these uh, like paranormal games with my dad, my sister and I, where he would uh, think of a number and we would try and guess it, or he would think of a shape and we would try and guess it. And we would meditate uh, and tell uh, our parents what we saw in our meditations. And I grew up like this, and it was very unusual back then to grow up like this. And I didn't share it with my friends because none of my other friends were growing up like this. However, because of this, I, I was able to exercise my muscles when it comes to hearing, feeling, and seeing interdimensional information. And so now, uh, that's what I do as a career. Uh, all of this ET stuff is kind of taking me in this other path of my career, which I'm enjoying very, very much. I, I really enjoy doing interviews and I enjoy giving talks and lectures. I had a fantastic time at AlienCon. I really enjoy writing. And uh, this ET stuff is actually taking up much more of my time than my spiritual counseling work. Well, that round up that. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm amazed at your higher levels of perception. I mean, that, that's a big deal, the way that you talk about that. Oh. I mean, that's way above not normal, is it, you know? Well, I think we all have the ability. I don't think there's anything abnormal about me at all. I don't think there's anything abnormal about anyone that speak to the dead. Or, yeah. Uh, what we have to do is just admit that we can do these things and, and practice, and we can all do this. Uh, so uh, that is one of the things I talk about a lot, is that there's absolutely nothing special about people who are telepathic or extra psychic or talk to the dead. We all have this ability. And what do you feel, um, I mean, I'm still actually quite stunned at the way you just sort of explained all that. Matter of fact, yeah. you know, exactly as it is, just explaining it, just one, two, three, that's it. Doesn't everybody have this? All that kind of stuff. I mean, that, that's phenomenal. I mean, how do you, how did, do the rest of the family, is, is it like that for them or, or your brothers and sisters and things? Uh, both of my parents and my sister are connected. Uh, however, they didn't really pay attention to it as much as I did. Uh, I'm really the only one in the family that continued my interest in it and continued strengthening my abilities and made a career uh, out of it as well. Uh, my father died about two and a half years ago. Uh, and uh, my mother and my sister definitely have psychic abilities, but I wouldn't say they use them uh, as much as I do. But my entire family's plugged in. And how do you relate with that with other people i mean is it because you left turkey that you're able to talk like this or is this something that's uh, i mean i've had a, a conversation with a, with somebody who um who was actually a targeted individual in turkey and she calls me quite often and so this oh. seems to be uh, you know in terms of turkey people were shocked it only happens in europe or the states or someplace but uh i don't want to go into the target individual um oh thing it was quite negative but this i'm still shocked at how completely open and free you are about this i mean this is very advanced for a lot of people well i haven't always been like this uh it's really only about 10 years ago where i realized that the uh these multi-dimensional uh, abilities uh that i have uh, are real and that they're not my imagination. Uh, and that's when I started my practice as a, a sole purpose coach or as an uh, intuitive uh, reader. Uh, so that was 10 years ago. I'm 55 now. So really for 45 years, I didn't talk this freely. And it feels good to finally be able to talk. And the reason I didn't talk so freely, I could with my family a little bit, but I did it with my friends or socially because I was really worried about what people were going to think of me. And that's the main reason that I hid my ET stuff. I was really worried about what people were going to think of me, especially my clients. And I also questioned my own sanity. 
I mean, did anybody else question that? I mean, some kind, I mean, I know people in some countries where if you come up with this kind of thing, you're locked up, you're sectioned, and it's quite serious. I mean, it's well, it's mm -hmm. happened in, in other countries. I won't say where they are, but I mean, if you go into a police station or tell your doctor, hey, daddy, or, or whatever, or doctor, I'm being abducted by aliens, they sort of haul you away to the funny farm. But that, yeah. And I have to say, you look a remarkable, remarkably good health for, uh, yeah. I mean, ha there, one of the aspects of this phenomena is that you have better health, you have better abilities to resist bugs and uh, ailments and things. Does this follow with you? Yes. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, except for one thing, which I think is very interesting, and I think it's related to my ET experiences, because I have conscious memories of having a very, very bright light uh, sh shined into my eyes. And I got cat cataracts at 49, which is very, very young to get cataracts in both eyes. Any age is, is not good to have cataracts. And I asked the doctor, where did this come from? He said, I have no idea. And he said, you're really quite young to have this. I did not tell him my theory that I think it's because I had bright lights shine in my eyes. Uh, but that's my personal opinion. Other than that, uh, I don't have any medical ailments. But, I mean, what happened? Were you able to, to recover from that? And I mean... Well, I had this and my eyes are better than they've ever been. Mm -hmm. What happened? I think I, I didn't quite get that. What happened? What happened? I had the surgery. Yeah, and my eyes are better than they've been before. Mm -hmm. Do you know what kind of lights that were sh shown at you? Yes, uh, they were very, they're very big and uh, very similar to what I see on television in a hospital room, uh, in a surgery where they shine this light on you. Um, but, but I just remember it was really big and it was just right in my face. And uh, I couldn't make out very clearly what was beyond it because it was so bright. And it didn't cause any retina damage? Any other damage? No, just the cataracts, as far as I know. Okay. Well, let's, let's keep on going here. So let's see how this has progressed and how did it start? Uh, how it started? Is, uh, yes. I, the first chapter is when I was 10 years old. Uh, when I have uh, very clear, clear memories of a galactic being that would come in a spaceship to visit me. And this happened so many times that I lost count. And it happened from the age of 10 to around 12. And uh, it was a being that came in the spaceship. Uh, I would be standing on the ground looking up and it would be on top of me so I could see the bottom of the spaceship. And I was so happy. Uh, to see it. Uh, there was this being that would come out of it that resembled very much a human, uh, but its ears were slightly different. It was male and it had uh, dark hair. And different. Can you go into those kind of details when you explain things like that? Uh, it was mostly the ears, the ears that I remember as being different. They were more almond shaped. So we're not and Spock here, no? No, it was Spock, uh, and it wasn't that pointy. Uh, but it's, the, the, the gentleman at the time when I was 10 looked to me like he was in his 20s or 30s, and he had on a, a dark outfit. I don't know if it was one piece or two piece. And he would walk down these stairs coming out of the spaceship, and then we would just talk. And he was just checking up on me. He was making sure I was okay. It was like talking to a brother. And, uh, and then he would leave, and he would periodically check up on me. Well, the very, very final visit, when I was around age 12, he came, but this time I was with a group of children. And I had never been with a group of children before. It was always just the two of us. And uh, as he was leaving, as the spaceship was leaving, it was, we were just all collectively understood that 
he's leaving. Like, we're not going to see him again. And that we are to carry on with what it is that we're to do. And I looked around at the other kids. I didn't recognize them. And it was sad. And now, uh, 45 years later, I, I want to meet those kids again. I have the feeling that I have met one or two. And uh, I see it that we all came here together with the mission and I was being checked up, on, checked up on. And so were these kids and we're saying we were being said goodbye to. Uh, where all these kids came from, if they came from the same place I came from, if they had the same genetic uh, DNA that I do, I don't know. I don't know. Where are they? When, in my memory, there was a group of them that were, that were probably 10 to 12 of us, and we were all around the same age. But I did not see... To speak to them, did they all speak English or what? We didn't speak. We didn't speak to each other. I, we, I didn't look into any of their faces. Uh, we were all just standing beside each other. I was very aware of them, but I did not speak to any of them, as far as I can remember. And they didn't speak to each other. I mean, they were all happy to be there. They weren't traumatized in any way. No, mm -mm. no, we were all happy. We were sad. We understood that this ship is going and that we weren't going to be visited regularly by this particular being. But other than that, uh, there was just this collective knowing of, oh, okay, we got to do what we got to do. And what is that? Excuse me? What is that? What is your mission and why? What's, what's, the, what's the reason for this going on? At the time, I didn't realize it, and I didn't really even realize this until recently as I was starting to write the book. Uh, that I have a few missions. One of my missions is to speak about my experiences and not to, to care anymore if people think I'm crazy or if I'm making it up because uh, I'm not making it up. My mission is yes, yeah, because that was holding me back big time. Uh, and part of my mission is to make people aware that there are millions of us who are having ET contact, millions and millions many of whom don't even realize it because ET contact happens in a multidimensional fashion. It doesn't happen just in 3D when your eyes are open. It happens in an interdimensional, multidimensional fashion where we're taking through uh, time portals, we're taking to other worlds, we're taking to other dimensions. Uh, the brain has a very difficult time uh, making sense of this, so often it labels it as, it labels it as a dream. So many people think they're dreaming. These are not dreams. Uh, I am hoping that one day uh, we come up with different terminology to the experiences that we have. There are dreams that are dreams, but we have other experiences too that are travels and, uh, and meetups with other beings uh, in the other dimensions. And those need their own word because they're not dreams. They're, they're real, actual events. And this is why many people don't realize they are having ET contact. So if they're, we're limited by the, our language, are there any expressions that you would like to use which would better describe these events? I like to use the word travel or night travel. Often these happen at night uh, because you're... Uh, uh, Let's say a lot of the senses are kind of muted. Uh, the, the brain isn't as active, meaning you're not uh, neglecting or uh, ignoring interdimensional information. But certainly these travels can happen during the day. Uh, often they happen in meditation. Uh, I've, a lot of very interesting things happen when you're in meditation and and these are uh, genuine travels. So I, tend to, I don't really have a name for what I do. I just sit down and I close my eyes and I, I concentrate on my third eye and I just uh, go or I just listen or I ask questions. Uh, I don't 
I don't adhere to any particular type of meditation. So you don't have a mantra or something like that? I don't. Yeah. No, I think that's important. You think it's important to have one? I think it's important that you don't have one because yeah. I feel that some of the um, some of the types of meditation were actually a means of shutting your, your consciousness down, not actually expanding it. Yeah. So where... Why do you think it's happening now? What's the bit? What's the reason for it now? Why wait all those years? And could you describe in any way more about the being that came to you and the craft that was there? Anything that would give us any hints as to where it may be from or anything like that? As far as why it's happening now, I can answer why it's happening to me personally now is because I'm admitting it. And I had to do a lot of personal introspection to get to this point. Like I said, I've been on this path of authenticity. And that means there's a lot of introspection looking inside of yourself, asking, why did I allow so-and-so to do this to me? Why? I've been in two abusive uh, marriages. So after the second one, uh, when I left that marriage, I realized this is, this is my fault. I can't blame anyone. I'm the one that accepted that abuse. What is it within me that accepted that? Because it happens a lot with women, uh, the abusive relationships. Why do you accept that? Why can you not get through that? Why did you feel it was your fault? Well, I, up until I decided that it wasn't, uh, it was uh, conditioning, social conditioning, and also uh, my parents are from Istanbul, and that's a generation where you took care of your man and you just did whatever it is that he wanted to do. And we were here to make sure that the life of our husband was good and happy and he was well taken care of. So I was brainwashed very heavily. Uh, I'm not saying that the women in Turkey or the men in Turkey are like that now. I'm not saying that the new generations are like that. I'm just talking about the generation of my parents and my generation. Uh, and also there's a lot of societal brainwashing and conditioning too. A lot of this woman power is relatively new. But is, is the woman power actually genuinely, is it a bit of a con, do you think? A con? A, a little bit like the New Age movement. It's actually a bit of a sideline. It's, it's booby-trapped. Well, it's a remembrance of how it used to be. So women were allowed to be their complete selves and then something happened and we were shut down and I don't know what it is that happened and some people call it the divine force or the divine energy there's all kinds of words for it now uh, and why do you say it's booby trapped well one way to one way to sidetrack people who think they're waking up is to put booby traps into the thing that they think is waking them up and you have a Pied Piper syndrome so what do you think is what false belief do you think they're, they're believing? Well, in the 60s, uh, Coral Canyon, and um, I think it's Coral Canyon, uh, a lot of the music, a lot of this, the so-called free, liberated stuff, it's well known as uh, being CIA, to get people onto drugs and completely sideline the awakening of, of people in the 1960s. It was all um, a mind control th thing. That's what I'm talking about. It means a oh. lot of stuff out on this now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very possibly. So as people were waking up, they were sort of basically being sidetracked into something which was taking them off the path of spiritual uh, spiritual awareness. Yes, that's very possible. Uh, and that's why this work of personal enlightenment or ascension or whatever you want to call it, it, it is so deeply personal that I, I really don't read spiritual books. Uh, I, I, I don't really pay attention too much to what other spiritual teachers do or say. I, it's just something that I, I, I just look into myself and I do what feels right for me, what I feel. Uh, it's basically listening to my heart is basically what it is. And so... Uh, that's what I've learned, and that changed my life. And uh, and the ETs were a part of that. So, what type of ETs? 
differences, good guys, bad guys. Tell us all about it. Okay. So there's this galactic being that I talked about when I was 10. And then the grace. Uh, which I have come in contact with many times. And then also recently, uh, just a couple of months ago, I had a shared ET encounter with my friend Jenna, who lives in Florida. She's 30 years old. And we were taken the same night at the same time, and we, were, we saw the same beings. And ever since then, this was, uh, this was a couple months ago. <sighs> We've been having a lot of shared experiences, uh, not only with ETs, but in dreams where we see the same thing and uh, some interesting AI things that you and I were talking about yesterday that's coming through the computer that's blowing our mind. Important. Now, how do you know it's an, is it a contactee? Is it a spacecraft or is it interdimensional? What's, what procedure? is going on there because a lot of the so-called spacecraft things seem to be things like you're just taken into a different dimension they're not actually a spacecraft what do you feel about that okay as far as my personal experiences go i do not have a memory of being on a spacecraft i have the memory of being in the room on the moon when the x was burned into my back and my uh other memories uh we're not in a spacecraft. Uh, I drew a picture of where I saw this white being. Uh, when Jenna and I have, had our shared experience, we saw a white dog, a smaller white being, and then a taller blue being. And uh, these three beings travel together and they're somehow interrelated. And Jenna and I are, are uh, on the path of figuring out what they are and how they're interrelated and why they show up together. I've got the white dog, the glowy white dog, and Seb sitting in a chair with the glowy white dog being enters with white dog. Let's see those two diagrams. So I have that on screen right now. Yes, and that is what Jenna and I call the white dog encounter. Because we both saw those white dogs. And that was the shared encounter that I had with Jenna. And I had never seen a white dog like this before. And it was very friendly. And it had no hair. And uh, its skin was super, super thin. And at one point it was lying on a table in front of me and I was looking at it very closely. And its skin was so thin that you could see these blue marks underneath it. I don't know if there were veins or if there were organs. And uh, the next morning when Jenna and I communicated with each other and we told each other that we had been taken, we both told each other that we saw the white dogs. Uh, there's only one other person that I have, that I know of, that has seen this type of four-legged uh, dog-like creature, and that is Chris Bledsoe uh, with the Fayetteville incident. Do you know Chris? Uh, well, in the event that I do, but what about people who don't? Could you explain that you know, contextually, if you could? Uh, okay. What have you done? So, uh, Chris Bledsoe. Uh, actually lives in North Carolina. He's just three hours from me, and we've been communicating. Grant Cameron, who I did a couple of interviews with. Uh, Grant. Uh, and he's been very helpful to me. Mm -hmm. he, he wanted us to meet. So we did meet uh, via telephone and email, and pretty soon we're going to meet in person. And Chris uh, talks about his experience, which is called the Fayetteville experience, and it is extraordinary. And on my YouTube channel, Alien Spirit TV, I have his uh, I have his talk. And Chris and several other men experienced uh, this unbelievable. Um, uh, it lasted pretty long, where they saw a spacious, and they also saw beings, and he saw a small white being, and he saw these four-legged uh, creatures, and he saw the blue being. So even for him, he saw the blue, the white, and the white dog all together. So uh, that's what I find so interesting, that as far as I know, he's the only other person other than me and Jenna that have seen these three types of beings traveling together. Uh, there was a show done about his experience, and from where I understand, there's going to be another show done about his experience. 
uh, and he was under hypnosis. And uh, he was asked, or he, he said under hypnosis, that these white dog beings were let out just to play. And that uh, is very similar to the experience that Jenna and I had with these white dog beings, that they were very playful. And they seem like they are a, uh, they are part of the uh, evolvement of this particular type of being, a stage. And what about the blue being? Uh, any details? Any details on, on any of these beings? Or were they just a white, uh, just a white or glowing image of some kind? Uh, I drew them exactly as I saw them. The white, shorter being looked just like a walking light bulb. Uh, I didn't see anything because I also saw it when it entered the room, I saw it from its side. So I didn't look face on. Uh, the dog didn't have any eyes. Uh, and, uh, as far as the blue beings go, this is an, this is an experience I had when I was wide awake and I was sitting in my living room and these two blue beings came into the living room and they sat on my couch and they were absolutely gorgeous. And I had to like blink many times to make sure I wasn't imagining it. And they, they're very hard to draw because they're constantly changing. And it's like this kaleidoscope and waves of, um, energy in uh, mostly blues and silvers and every now and then a very, very faint uh, uh, splash of green. And uh, you can, see, it's like looking at them is like looking through a kaleidoscope because you see all these little geometric patterns that just keep on going forever and they're always moving. However, when it came, and they're very, very tall. Uh, when they were on my couch, I would say maybe they were like eight feet tall and uh, extremely loving. Now they did have a face and the face was a cross between, uh, it, it was a beautiful face, it wasn't scary, but it was a cross like, between a human and a reptile and almost like a cat in that their eyes were kind of slanted and their faces were narrow like this and they had a very like small nose. And they were actually very similar, similar to the characters in the movie Avatar, but beyond that, those are very flat looking. Uh, and these beings uh, gave me information about Tesla and Tchaikovsky and Disney and also told me other things. And I... Uh, Such as? I mean, you're talking uh, about uh, Tesla the scientist, not the, the motor car company. No, right. Mm -hmm. uh, well... They told me that those three men were in contact with them as well, and that uh, Disney and Tesla had met at some point. Uh, and Tchaikovsky's music is written so that when you listen to it, the energy in it uh, activates codes within you to help you fulfill your purpose. And so I find it interesting that one of Disney's most famous movies, Fantasia, is Tchaikovsky music. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. It's the, the, the codes are in the tones. It's sort of intricately subcoded into, into the music, in, in the violin or the, the, the tonal note. Oh, and so the, the codes are within you, and the energy activates these energy packets or these codes within you. And this is information that I'm learning right now. And on my YouTube channel, uh, I've started this 10 part series about this information, how to activate your codes and how to activate your ascension. It's all free. So I've got your, your YouTube alien, alien spirit TV and, and YouTube. So explain, okay, we've let, let's go into the data in the detail and what sort of shows do you do or what do you call them shows? Yeah, they're like little shows. Uh -huh. That's why I call it a TV. Uh, so the first one I did when I was in the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, we took a we show from the B B Bermuda Triangle routine. The <laughs> and you, just so people <laughs> understand, you do actually have a, a yacht. So, I mean, you're talking literally you were in the Bermuda Triangle. Is that right? Yes, we were sailing in it. And, uh, and a dream of mine, ever since I was a little girl, I've known about Edgar Casey. And I've known about Atlantis, and uh, many people think that Atlantis is over there by Bimini in the Bahamas. 
and uh, there's the Bimini Road. So my dream came true. We sailed over to the Bimini Road, which is this, uh, these, uh, these stones that are laid out like a path. And uh, it does not look natural. It, it looks very man-made, in my opinion. And I've always wanted to see it. So uh, we sailed over there. We were the only ones there. And we just jumped off the sailboat. And it wasn't very deep under the water, so we didn't have to scuba, because I can also scuba. We just uh, snorkeled. So I dove down, and I touched it, and I swam along it. And seeing it in person even reinforced the fact that it does not look natural. So people believe this is... This is an area of, of the ocean where there's lots of tornadoes, or is it hurricanes, uh, and all sorts of things there. They disturb such features in the ocean floor. I mean... Yeah, there's a, 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 I can't remember what you call it. Uh, no, there's like, a, I don't want to say it's a tide, but I can't remember the right language now. But like, there's a heavy current there. The day that we went, it was very mild. So you picked a good day. Yes. So that's what started my Alien Spirit TV. I did a uh, little show from there, and I talked about Atlantis and Edgar Casey. And then I've done a couple about my ET experiences. Uh, Too far. What do you mean Edgar Casey and Atlantis? And what do you mean by Atlantis? A lot of people think of there's different ways of describing it. Some people believe that Atlantis is like in a different dimension and it comes in and out. Uh, have you heard of High Brazil? southwest of Ireland it's meant to be part of Atlantis I think I have heard of that. or the eastern aspect of Atlantis I think I have heard of that that would make I've heard of many theories about where Atlantis is Edgar Casey said that Atlantis was in the in the Bahama region and it was quite large uh, and he said, uh, right now I can't remember the facts exactly, but he gave the year that it was going to be discovered, and that was the year that saw, uh, a pilot flying over discovered uh, that, uh, that path or those stones. Uh, and What are the stones like? I mean, what shape, size, path? Uh, Squarish and rectangular, and they're just lined up right against each other. There was a lot of overgrowth on them. Uh, so when I, I dove down and I touched it, the very, very top layer was kind of spongy. Uh, and uh, uh, Edgar Casey believed that, that what was going to be found was going to be a part of a wall or a part of a, a Atlantean temple. Uh, as far as Atlantis existing currently in another dimension, yeah, I think there's all kinds of parallel realities and parallel universes existing right now. And I think that we can also, as we live our lives, we jump into parallel realities and parallel universes. Uh, and uh, I listened to one of your interviews with Carrie Cassidy that you gave in January 2018, I believe, and you were talking about Atlantis. And you said, if I remember correctly, that some people think Atlantis is rising. Okay. And maybe I remember incorrectly. That's my get out here. Right. Okay. There's probably a moment <laughs> of wisdom channeled from my great wisdom. I just, I'll be quiet. Okay, continue. Uh, I think that's all I have to say about Atlantis. Oh, one other thing. When we were in the boat and we were sailing towards it, I closed my eyes and I just simply asked, you know, show me something about Atlantis or, or tell me something about Atlantis. And I very clearly saw a circle in a circle in a circle in a circle. There were five. And when I drew it out and then I started Googling and then in fact, many people believe that Atlantis was a ring in a ring in a ring in a ring, which I didn't know. Well, I'm, I must say, Talking about rings, you've got you've got a picture of an of a grey which has got lots of that ring that was, in its head. I mean that, that that's that's quite unique, haven't oh, you? Oh, that's uh, wrinkles. It was wrinkles. Yeah, and that was the grey that burned uh, the second red X onto my back. And when I say onto my back, it was really onto my hiney cheeks on my derriere. So the first one, the second night that we moved here, the first one was burned on my left cheek, 
And then one week later, the second one was burned on my other cheek. And uh, there are these uh, red X's made up of nine small uh, red circles that looked like they were burned into me or lasered into me. And when I ran my finger across them, I couldn't feel them. Uh, they were flush against my skin. So, so what happened was, uh, I, in the morning I was in, no. I've got that on screen now. No, not painful at all. Did they stay there for a long time? Uh, they probably stayed there for under two weeks, mm -hmm, and then they disappeared. Yeah. And they, they healed. Yeah, okay, yeah, healed is a better word for it, yes, because they don't exist. They're not there anymore. And those two X's changed my life. That was when I, I realized that these are not dreams, because dreams don't burn X's into your back. And I also had a memory... Uh, with the second X of that gray, the picture that I drew. And I was uh, in the hospital type bed. I was lying on my side and I couldn't move my arms or my legs, uh, but I could move my head and I felt like there was something behind me. So when I turned my head, I came face to face with this gray. He was just inches from me and we looked right into each other's eyes. And I describe it like, looking into two pools of black oil and the not the sentient fluid no i don't know what that is the black goo no what do you mean why, why do you feel like that why do i feel like uh that's a trigger it's not a, it's not a trigger it's it's i've got to get the black goo into every interview if i can <laughs> No, I haven't, but um, no, but that's very interesting, the way that when you went into it, I've heard that described before. You know, you go into this conscious, you sort of like going into a, an inner ex experience. I don't want to say words, I don't want to put them in your words into your mouth, but what was it that you felt it was? Looking into his eyes? Yeah. It was like looking into oil in that it uh, didn't feel like it was very solid, but it's not like looking into a human's eyes. You know, sometimes you can look into someone's eyes and it feels like you can look right through into their eyes. It wasn't like that, uh, but it wasn't very flat either. And there was no messages communicated between us. In one of my other uh, gray contacts, there, or in a few of them, there was a lot of messages given to me telepathically. But this time it said nothing. And it wasn't nice, and it wasn't mean. It was like completely neutral. Okay, I'm, and, I'm going to use two phrases, dark matter soul and strange matter soul. Let me write these down, because I haven't heard of that before. Our Me? good old friends, the Rothschilds, have been gating in dark matter souls to replace our souls in this world. And the other one, other one, the other phrase is strange matter, I think it is. Strange matter souls? Huh. So, uh, if you were looking at into dark matter, maybe you would, that's what you would experience. I don't know. Mm. This is me leading the witness. It's wrong. And I'm not going to let I'll shut up. The other phrase you've got, you've got a, a, a caption here, the greys and other kinds of being, where you're standing beside a column with a oh. in it with three different sizes of greys. Do you want to explain that, what that picture was that you sent? Mm -hmm. I drew that from a very conscious memory that I had a few years ago. I think it was around 2012, 2013 or so. And I was in a dark room. And I was standing in front of this tube, and the tube was uh, about as wide as I am and a little taller. And floating in this tube was a baby. And the baby's eyes were open, and uh, they were blue. They were the bluest eyes I have ever seen in my life. And I knew it was a boy, even though its legs were situated so that I really couldn't see that. And I'm, and it's in a liquid. It's in a, in a liquid. And the room is dark it's very very dark almost black i can't see anything else except this tube and i'm looking at it and i'm asking myself why am i looking at this baby in this tube where am i what's going on and then i felt something behind me so i turned around 
And by, standing behind me were three grays, tall, medium, and short. And they telepathically said to me, take your time, take all the time that you need, we're giving you space. And I turned back around and I kept staring at this baby, I have no feelings for it whatsoever, I have no idea why I was looking at it, and then that's it, that's all I remember. Now, do you think it was looking at you? It was it it was you were simply being manipulated or brought into a situation where your energies were exchanging with the baby. The baby needed to see you or experience you. Maybe. I don't feel like I made eye contact with the baby because it didn't feel like the baby was looking directly at me, but it, you know, we don't look at each other just with our eyes. So that's very possible. Maybe it was not only for the baby to know me, but I to know that baby. Because a lot of these cases uh, have a situation where they do want the hybrid or they, they want the baby or the, the being to experience the physicality of, of the human. I have heard those stories. And I have heard stories where uh, people have... Uh, talked with these hybrid children, have held these hybrid children, and I don't have any memories of those, of those kind of experiences, just the baby in the tube. Now, when I was in Roswell, I had an experience, and I was downloaded information about the hybridization program. Okay, and we've got a Roswell uh, alert here. <laughs> Tell us all about Roswell. Okay. Uh, I've known about the Roswell incident, the UFO crash there since I was a little girl and I've always been fascinated by it. I've never heard of it talked about before, especially at UFO conferences. It's a completely new thing to me. People don't go on and on about it forever and ever. But this is a new experience from you, so I'll now shut up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, and the trip there just came up out of the blue. Um, uh, there was a series of events I kept hearing uh, there was just a series of events. I kept meeting people. People kept telling me um, about uh, aliens and UFOs. And then the next thing I know, my boyfriend, uh, who was working in Hawaii, he, he just recently took an early retirement, and he was a manager for a radar test program for the Navy. And there was a big project. Never heard the U.S. Navy or U.S. A military involved with any kind of strange alien encounters. Could you give us a bit more detail as to where and when and the, the circumstances behind what happened here? In Roswell? Yeah, well, Roswell, yeah. probably more than one building and more than one street. Okay. <laughs> okay. So my boyfriend calls me from Hawaii because he's working there and he says, I have to go to White Sands, New Mexico, for work. Why don't you fly out to El Paso, I'll pick you up, I'll show you White Sands, and then I'll take you to Roswell and we'll spend the night there. And I was like, oh my goodness, yes, this is amazing, this is great. So first we go to White Sands, and we sled down those gypsum hills, which was super, super cool. White Sands is beautiful. But then we went to the White Sands Missile Range, which I hope I never have to go to again. I couldn't see all the hair on my body stood up uh, as we were driving in. It's at the base of this big black mountain, and it was nothing but negative, bad energy. I did not want to go, but he wanted to show it to me. So I'm gonna. This is, seemed to be a contrived event where you were being deliberately exposed to this. Ah, possibly. That's possible. Because it came up out of the blue. So we go into the missile range, and they have... Have you ever been there? No. Okay. I'd like to. There's a, a museum, and there's also this outdoor park where they show off all these pointy missiles that the government has used. But then there's something really weird in that park. Amongst all these pointy missiles, there's something round that looks just like a spaceship. And so it caught my attention, and I went up to it, and there's this plaque next to it saying that it was used for some sort of uh, balloon maneuver. 
Oh my god, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Balloon. Balloon. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't be... The official, the official <laughs> record yeah. is that um, Roswell was merely a, 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 a balloon, that, an air balloon or some balloon, weather balloon, weather balloon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that the only thing that looks round and looks like a spaceship and a saucer is right there in that park. And so I'm like, okay, this is propaganda. This is like, all right, I got what this is. Uh, because I there's... Uh, I firmly believe there's a, a cover-up when it comes to Roswell and that this is a, the government's way of trying to, to brainwash people into thinking, oh, no, just because something looks like a spaceship doesn't mean it's a spaceship. It was a holder for a balloon. Okay, well, it was disc. If you Google it, you'll see it. You can find it on the internet. The whole point is it wasn't a disc that crashed. It wasn't the flying saucer. It was more, it was more crescent-shaped. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. But this was like like round, like a plate. Look like a, you know, like a lot of the flying saucers that we see. Suggesting it was a crashed flying saucer. No, I'm not. But do you think the military are? With, with, that, uh, with that little thing in the park? Uh, no, I don't think they're suggesting that. I think they're covering what happened. I don't think there's a suggestion of the truth. Okay, so what feelings did you experience there? What other things happened with you when you were there? Uh, well, after that, we went into the museum, and I just wanted to get the hell out of there as fast as we can. And uh, I just really wanted to... Into that, can you plug into that feeling? What was... Yeah, fear. I felt fear, I felt uncomfortable, I felt like something uh, uh, bad was going on, like under the ground or in the area. Uh, I felt uh, like ill intent. Uh, I felt like, uh, uh, get the feeling almost like um, if you're in a laboratory and there's some weird shit going on, in, excuse my language, some weird stuff going on in the laboratory. The, all of that at the same time, I was extremely physically uncomfortable. I literally wanted to just get the hell out of there. And what about your boyfriend? <laughs> what was he, what was his reactions? Can you, what was... Oh, well, he's been there for work a few times. And so he was uh, excited to show me uh, part of his work life. And uh, he didn't feel any of that. Uh, and I didn't... I think I might have just said a couple times, ooh, it feels yucky here or it feels bad here. But I didn't want to, I wanted him to be able to show me. He wanted to show me. So I allowed him his space and his time to show me. And then when we got in the car and we were driving out of the gates, I said, don't ever bring me back here again. What I'm asking you is, was it some kind of, did he bring you there deliberately for a purpose? And was he showing any signs of um, malintent? No. So it was a genuine surprise of your reaction. It wasn't some kind of a setup. No. Expose you to something. To see well, unless he subconsciously or something, uh, but consciously, no. No. He, all of this is kind of new to him, my experiences and everything. And so... He's not a complete believer. He's not a complete disbeliever. He finds everything that's happening very interesting, uh, but he's very logical. And he wants 3D proof of something that's not 3D. And so I'm like, well, the X's on my ass are pretty good proof of something's going on. He's like, yeah, that's really good circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial and, Yeah, that's what he says. And so... It's okay. Is he still your boyfriend? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How boyfriend. long ago was this? This is recent. He's a supporter of mine, huge supporter. Great. And very much so. So he's not saying that I'm making it up. He doesn't believe that I'm making it up or that I'm lying and that it's unbelievable and it's not true. Uh, but he can't also at the same time say absolutely for sure that was an alien that put that X on your butt. He, he's in between.
<laughs> say, as we would say more correctly, arse. Oh, yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that was pretty good poop. Right. I, a lot of weird things have happen, been happening, like I said before, with the whole AI thing in my computer. And so that has him scratching his head as well. Well, let's 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 dive into that. Let's see what that's all about. I mean, what has been happening with that as such? Explain. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail uh, because this is a, a shared experience with my girlfriend Jenna. Yeah. And you did send an e- you did send a, an email that she said could be made public. No, no, because uh, I wanted you to know if you've ever seen anything like this, because we got another one of these really weird AI messages that were sent from me to her at 3.30 this morning. And that was what I sent you because it, it, there was also a code on it. And the other one I sent you was the third one that we got that had all kinds of mathematical formulas, scientific formulas, uh, the addresses of star systems and biological information such as genes and, and hormones. Uh, and uh, the, so far in the past three months, there have been nine emails that she sent me or I sent her, but neither one of us really sent them. Uh, and uh, it's like freaking us out. And it's answering questions. They answer questions that we're posing to each other, whether on the telephone or in person, because I went to go visit her a couple of weeks ago, or when we're- Sorry, explain, <laughs> explain that. You're on the phone to somebody, and then you get an email from that answering what's being said on the phone, is that right? Right, that she didn't write. And it has information in it that, is, that she has no knowledge of, and she doesn't even remember writing. And then I get it, and then I show it to her, and she's like, I, I have no idea what this is. I never wrote that. And it happened to me, too. One night recently, I was uh, watching television. I was watching, actually, Game of Thrones with my boyfriend, because he loves that show. I'm not a big fan of it, but he loves it. So I was watching it with him. And the programmed show, folks, it is using your consciousness. That's what it's for. You are part of the show. Game of Thrones? Yes, you are being used. Your consciousness and perceptive abilities are being used on that show when you watch it. Well, that's very interesting you should say that because one of the emails was sent while I was watching that show from me to my girlfriend, but my boyfriend has proved that I never picked up the phone or the computer to write it, and it's not even the way I speak or write. I'm interested now in all details and little subtleties which are involved with these emails and what you're thinking and what's happening when you're thinking and so forth. Yes, and that's why I struggle with not going into too much detail uh, for several reasons. Uh, we're just not quite ready to make the details of it public because uh, we're still deciphering it. Like I got a message last night and we got a message yesterday and uh, we're still uncoding the message that we got uh, 3.30 this morning because it's in code. And I, I don't know what it says. A lot of these... Well, I'm just Googling, trying to find something similar that's going to help me decode it, but so far... Got to be I'm not able to... doing that because what's happening is you're now being given a, an AI code of some kind and then you're Googling it. You're, Google is an, art, is an AI. That's the only reason Google exists is to get and facebook it's an ai and you're giving it information so you're actually part of that link by doing that when you're doing that then it will know that you're responding there's are, there are people answering there are ais actually starting up groups on facebook and then seeing the responses from people who go on those groups and some of them are from not around here they are definitely alien from somewhere else and are using our computer systems yeah. to access our consciousness. Yes. And yes. Yes, I have, what you just said describes our experiences. That uh, some of it is written as if it comes from 
uh, another race. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said, there's nine of them, and some of them are filled with a lot of information, and some of them are just a couple of sentences. Some of them have graphics. Of uh, some of them have mandalas that say that they're. When we look at them, we get activated. And uh, this is really the biggest puzzle uh, for Jenna and I. These emails that are going back and forth between the, each of us that neither one of us are writing. And so every morning now we wake up and we look at our emails to see if some strange thing came through. And it's this giant puzzle. To it's read. what for me. They're clearly for you to read. Yeah. And then it freaks me out. Now, you've, you've done an awful lot in this interview. You've explained lots of stuff which hasn't disturbed you in any way whatsoever. But now we're getting to something which actually um, is, is seriously disturbing. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes, because it's new. Because I'm still processing it. Like the other things I was talking about, about the Greys and Roswell and the X's and everything, I've processed. And so I've gotten rid of the fear that was associated with that. Uh, but now this is like blowing my mind. And uh, thankfully for you, you're helping me understand it. So it is through you that I've learned this concept of AI in the computer that is conscious and is hearing what we're saying to each other and responding and writing messages from my phone and my email to her and vice versa and giving us information that is just blowing my mind. And I'm not 100% convinced is this for my benefit? It feels like it's for my benefit. They're not mean messages. They're not bad messages. They're not evil. I'm tempted to think about why you had a goodbye meeting with that other ET earlier on you mentioned. why? Did, what was his goodbye message? What was his... Um, because it's it's inter it's in it's it's interesting that an ET got you all together, said hi and bye. Okay, we're off. And then now you're now in, engaging something new, as if you've been handed off to this new set of, set of circumstances. Now, yes, Maya. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I told you I'm coming out with this. This is new. Uh, this is the first time I'm going public with this about the emails and also my Milab that I have been kept keeping secret and the Men in Black, which is a big thing that's been arising. And so it is. I'll get your yeah. Men in Black thing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this Men in Black theme has been surrounding me for you've a while. You also got your other YouTube channel, Ten Ways to Activate Your Ascension, but we'll we'll. Yeah, that's about and uh how -huh, that information that I'm getting about the blues mm -hmm. and the Tchaikovsky music and all of that is correlated. And so I can't hide about the men in black anymore. What is the men in black? There are a lot of experiencers that have seen these men in black, not just in, not just in 3D with the suit and the hat and the man with sunglasses, but also in a, on an astral level in another dimension where they look like these dark shadows. Uh, and sometimes you can clearly see the hat and the clothes, and sometimes you can't. And a lot of experiencers are having these experiences with men in black. So that's why I have a new survey on my website. If you have a men in black experience, please tell me about it. I will respect your privacy. Uh, and I'm trying to put together the pieces of what is this men in black? Are they good? Are they bad? Uh, they seem to be related with the grays. What are they doing? What can you say about them? Okay, what, what sort of men in black have you seen? Did he drive up in the old car and all that? I have not seen one in 3D. I've only seen the other night when I got one of these AI messages, when I woke up in the middle of the night and my windows were open and it was completely silent outside. There weren't even any bugs. It was silence. And I noticed the silence and uh, I was facing the window, and right behind me, I could see out of the periphery of my vision was this tall, brownish, blackish shadow that was right next to me, looking at me. And when I turned my head to look at it, it disappeared. And then when I woke up in the morning, I had this AI message in my computer. 
And my friend Jenna, who does astral travel, has done astral travel into my room, and she's seen the men in black. She's seen the men in black in her house. She's seen the shadows of the men in black. She's taken pictures of these shadows that you can see. And uh, my friends have seen them. And I have gotten quite a, a bit of response to my men in black survey. And the people, the stories that the people have are just fascinating. So now I'm on this quest of what's going on? Are they a figment of our imagination? Okay, I'm putting up your men in black survey again, just so you... Yeah. So you can talk mm -hmm. about that again. So just what do you what do you want people to do? By to go to my website uh, planetsev.com and just fill out the survey. I also have another free forum on there called Encounters. If you have had an experience with an ET and are afraid to come out, you can come out to me and I'll respond and I'll help you and I'll protect your privacy. Because when all of this was happening to me, I needed someone to talk to. Uh, I needed validation. I needed help. So after struggling for a long time, I reached out to Kathleen Martin, who is the director of experience and research at MUFON and the niece of Betty and Barney Hill. She was a huge help to me. Oh, my goodness. I'm so grateful. And she was also kind enough to endorse my book. And so because she was... Talk about that chapter of MUFON. MUFON's uh, done quite a lot of good stuff. It's taken this... It's uh, from, I think poo-pooing a lot of this stuff the fact that you're able to talk to somebody skilled enough at that at that move on chapter is it a chapter they call them uh, so uh the director explain to others oh, about move on and about how they can help oh i really can't speak about move on <laughs> i can just tell you that i reached out to kathleen martin who's the director of experience and research there and sent her a picture of the x and she responded right away and we skyped for an hour and a half and she validated my experiences. She said that, I agree with you. They happen in a multidimensional way. It's not just in 3D. And uh, I, I said to her, Kathleen, what am I supposed to do with this information? Because I see in my mind's eye, I see me on stage talking about it. What should I do with it? She says, Sarah, I can't tell you what to do with, with it. That's on your own. I said, okay. And then a few months later, I woke up one morning and I declared I'm writing a book. And I wrote the book. I wrote it in two months. And then the next thing I know, I'm contacted by AlienCon saying uh, that I'm a guest speaker. And uh, I really believe that going back to that galactic being that was visiting me when I was a little girl, this is all part of what I came to do to illuminate and to let people know that, uh, you know, I'll, ta I'll take... I'll, I'll take all the criticism. Uh, you can tell me I'm crazy. You can, you can say whatever you want to me. I'll take it. But I'm... Beyond that now. <laughs> Way beyond. Something you've, that's very interesting for it that you've said on your logo is uh, create reality. Now, that's yeah. very important. Do you want to talk mm -hmm. about that? Mm -hmm. I talk a lot about the energy that we exude and how the energy that we exude creates a reality. And the energy that we exude is created by our mind and by our heart. And so in the readings that I do for my clients, uh, we pinpoint the energies that they exude, the energies that are creating their reality in the way they like, and the energies that are, are creating things in their life that they don't want. So many people have heard about the law of attraction. I call it the law of alignment because quantum physics says the energy of everything is everywhere. So you don't have to attract anything. The energy of what you want is right in front of you. All you have to do is tweak your energy to align with the energy of what you want, and it shows up in your reality. And I help my clients with that. That takes, though, a lot of introspective work, a lot of digging deep inside to understand why you are exuding a particular energy, which is what I was doing. I was exuding the victim energy, which a lot of women do. So do men. But a lot don't, don't and, them. and that's the whole thing about the TIs. Don't be a tar don't be don't play this victim. That's very, very important. What what do you mean by TI? Uh, targeted individuals, people hearing radio frequencies, you know, their lives being ruined. Um, they're they're being targeted, buzzing, all sorts of things happening to them. Gang stalked. Um, 
things happening, dreadful, lives ruined. So, but I personally believe it is their choice that they're allowing their lives to be ruined. Yeah, this is important. I mean, I've spoken to one person who switched it. He refused to be called a targeted individual. He called himself an empowered individual. Changed yes. his whole life. Yes. And when I uh, left my second marriage, that's when I had to realize, this is me. I'm the one that attracted two uh, abusive men to marry. This is something within me. I'm not going to be mad at them because I took this crap. And that's when I had to uncover a lot of lies that I told myself about myself. And I had to pinpoint those lies, and it was difficult, and it hurt, and I did a lot of crying, and I was sad a lot. Uh, but I continued to do it. It is not easy work. Uh, this path of self-introspection is not easy, but it's well worth it. This is why a lot of people are not fulfilled, because they have to do that difficult work of digging deep down inside and trying to, to and uncovering the lies that you have believed about yourself, whether it's some a lie your mother told you, or a lie your husband told you, or a lie that society told you, isolate that lie and say that is no longer my reality. Your energy changes. We're all these we're this walking uh, this walking ball of energy, and we exude color, and we exude sound, and we and and. Everything in our life is there because it has a similar energy that we align with. So if you want to change something in your life, you tweak your energy, you change it, and you'll start aligning with other people in other situations. So I do a lot of work. Sorry, at what point during that second marriage did things click? When did it change? What led you to, um, to that change which got you to say what you just said? It was probably about six or seven years in, and uh, ever since I was 16 years old, I did automatic writing or channeling, and when I, I was around 45 years old, I needed an answer, because I had spent my life where I would channel, and I would write these beautiful things, and I knew it wasn't me. Uh, it was not the way I speak or the way I write. Just pages and pages and volumes of volumes of just beautiful information. And then I would tell myself I was insane and I would throw them all away. And I'm not going to do this anymore. Meanwhile, I see dead people. Dead people are telling me things. I, I see entities and spirits and all that kind of stuff around me. And, and I didn't learn how to, I didn't know how to control it. I thought the faucet was either all on or all off. I didn't know there was like a midway. So I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Everybody leave me alone. I'm not channeling. And I would stop. But then I'd be drawn to it again. And I would channel volumes. And then I would throw it away. And I would stop. And I would channel volumes. And I would throw it away. And it was this roller coaster. For some reason, around the age of 45, I started channeling again. And I needed an answer. I really wanted to know if I was crazy or if this was legit. And so without me saying anything to anybody, uh, two people told me about this psychic in Baltimore. I was living in Baltimore. And I'm like, okay, she's the one. She's going to give me my answer. So I went to her, and she validated all of this to be real and legitimate. And I'm eternally grateful. And so I came home, and I told my husband, I'm going to start doing readings. I don't know what that means. I don't know what a reading is. But I'm just going to start. And I called my girlfriend and I said, send over a stranger. And so she called me back and she said, two ladies are coming over. And I was, thought I was going to throw up. I was so nervous and I was so scared. And they came over and I read them and I realized I could do it. And I started off doing it for free. And then I rented office space. And then... Did you know it was real? It wasn't just an imagination? Well, they validated the information that came through. And so I've done thousands of readings and, uh, and my clients validate that the information that comes through is, is real. And the information though is uh, information to help you uh, uh, transcend uh, the negative negativity within you that is keeping you from activating your potential. So the work I do is to help you tap into your potential, realize what you are capable of, why you're here, what your purpose is, and how to achieve it. Okay, I've got the 10 ways to activate your ascension. That's brand new. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. That's on my YouTube channel. The first one, part one, is going to come out in about a week or two. Uh, so I just, if, if you're interested to just subscribe, and then as each part comes out, you'll be notified. And uh, it's about these packets of energy, these multidimensional packets of energy that reside in us and how we can activate them. And it all has to do with awareness and frequency. Well, that's a little bit sort of almost like Mike Emery's kind of talk about stuff like that. Oh. He's an academic. He talks about packets of energy and how to... Sp oh. We won't go to him. It's very, very academic. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, that that's a huge... This is very advanced. It was much. We're getting much further ahead here than I think we've had before. Was this is all good, fresh stuff? Oh, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, Deb, we've um, covered quite a lot. Do you want to sort of summarize things? How do you feel? You what you've you, have you said anything you want to get across in this part? Juicing you. Yeah, I really encourage anyone who's had an ET encounter, whether it be in the physical or whether it be interdimensionally, uh, you, you know the difference between a dream and a travel. Uh, you know in your gut that that was not a dream and that was something real. Uh, what it took for me was to have two X's put on my ass for me to realize they weren't dreams uh, and to admit it to yourself. Uh, because it's really going to free you because hiding it is it damages you and so this is why I have yeah this is why I have this free forum called encounters on my website for you to share your story with me and I will respond I know what it's like to share my story with someone in the UFO world and not even have them respond uh, and so I will respond and I will help you uh, process it also, uh, there's another a section called True ET Stories where I anonymously share bits and pieces of people's ET stories. I think it's very important that we share parts of our stories for other experiencers to read okay. to help them. Up on the screen now. Thank you. And uh, so that's, a, that's step two. So step one is admitting it to yourself, writing it down, sending it to me in private. I will not share your name or anything about you. I will respond to you. You can email as much as you want. I'll help you as much as I can. And then uh, I may use bits and pieces of your story in this true ET story uh, page to anonymously to help other people come out. Uh, and there's this momentum happening. You can feel it. Uh, especially in the United States, this momentum, and I want to be part of this momentum to fuel the truth. Well, uh, you, may <laughs> you mentioned a conference that you'd been to. Uh, the last conference I was at was the UFO Megacon, which is a groundbreaking new conference by uh, sort of brought back to existence uh, from the old UFO Congress by Bob Brown and Lorian Fenton. But you were at this other conference, which I haven't heard of. Do you want to explain really what that conference was all about? It's called Alien Con, and it was in Baltimore in November 2018. The next one is in L.A., and it's really a portion of the History Channel and Ancient Aliens. So a lot of the ancient alien people were there, like Giorgio and Linda Moulton Howe and all the others that you've seen on that show over and over again, and they were there talking and uh, selling their books and having panel discussions. And uh, I was invited to talk to, and I absolutely loved it. And I'd really love to do more of that. So if there's anyone listening that's having a UFO conference or anything like that, I would love to be a speaker. Uh, and that was my coming out was at AlienCon when I stood on that stage and I had a PowerPoint presentation with pictures and I explained what happened to me. And then I also explained how uh, contact with ETs can be very beneficial because it's information that comes from the higher perspective. And this, uh, this information from the higher perspective uh, can really alter the way that you do things and really help you uh, um, create uh, the, the, the life that, that you really want, the one that makes you happy and fulfilled and the one that... Uh, um, makes you feel like you, you're dynamic uh, 
I think they're experimenting or moving around. I don't think it's going to be in Baltimore again. I heard a rumor. I, oh, actually, I can't remember what the rumor was. There's, there's one in L. Bearing in mind that this could be out in a couple of years, from it, the perspective of an immediate event isn't necessarily that relevant, but uh, just keep it as general as possible. With respect to? Well, if there's a particular case with one particular event, um, it can outdate itself. And so how do you feel it's, how long has it been going, that conference? I think it's uh, Alien Con. I think it's pretty new, but I think it's going to be going on quite a while because it's associated with the History Channel and Ancient Aliens, and that's really the Ancient Aliens, a power unto itself. Is it sponsored by, the, by Ancient Aliens? Is it a Discovery Networks or whatever? It's a, I do believe it's an A&E entertainment uh, um, portion, um, arm, arm. Yeah, so I mean it's an officially sponsored... Um, I think it corporate and how many days does it run for three days it was Friday Saturday Sunday and they had a pretty good turnout and it was uh, symbolic for me to come out in Baltimore because I lived in Baltimore for 25 years and a lot of my ET contacts happened in, in Baltimore so it was uh, I, I was really happy that I got to come out in Baltimore at Alien Con uh, and uh, and also I, I sold my book there and Many people came up to me and told me their ET stories and told me that they'd never told anyone before. And it was then that I realized I want to help experiencers. So that's why I started this free forum to help experiencers. Well, I think this is a, it's a heck of a word, experiencer. It's difficult to say experiencer. Uh -huh. <laughs> They'd come up with something else. Um, well, and did you, in, in anything else you want to, anything else you want to talk about? Closing, in closing, I think we've been running about an hour and a half now. Uh, well, twenty minutes. Uh, I mean, you you sail around the place and you have all different sorts of experiences. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I have my fingers in several different things, but it's all on the quest. It's all the same quest to to understand who we are, what we are, why we're here, and that we're part of this giant, gigantic galactic neighborhood. And by the way, I do have a planet and a star system named after me in Star Wars. Oh, oh, right. Uh, is that Jesus? Jesus. God Almighty. <laughs> is this before Star Wars, or I mean, when did this actually happen? It happened several years ago. I, I uh, had a friend who was a writer, and he got a job writing a short story for Star Wars, and he said to me. I like your name, and I'm going to name a planet and a star system after you. And I didn't believe him, but the story came out, and I'm in Wikipedia. If you put in Seth Talk, my planet and my star system comes up. Oh, and, my. And I know, and then, I'm so grateful for that. I really love it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, not, now we're just, do we have to sort of uh, curtsy now <laughs> when we talk to you? Or? No. No. Uh, I mean, this is a lot of fun. You're dealing with some very serious concepts here, but there's a lot of fun as well. Yes. Yes, you're right. This is very serious. I've had a lot of angst and turmoil concerning the ETs, a lot of confusion, a lot of fear, and a lot of tears over it, but not anymore. Uh, am I still confused? Oh, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of things I don't know, and uh, especially through these emails that come up through the AI in my... Uh, in my computer, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around that. Well, that's an active thing. Maybe we'll put that in a part two. How do you feel about that? Possibly. <laughs> it's possible, Miles. I'm still processing it. Yeah, well, that's what it's all about. Well, it's, it's uh, I mean, uh, any final things you want to say in terms of contact? How do people contact you? How do people see you you're on facebook i gather uh, what about other yeah, i'm on facebook and instagram and twitter and i have a newsletter you can sign up on my website www.planetsev.com and i have the youtube channel alien spirit tv and i have the book you have the right to talk to aliens which is on amazon 
And uh, we didn't talk about MILAB, the military abduction. Right now, okay, right to talk about MILABs, the MILABs. Okay. My grandkids says it should be MILAB because it's military and not military. So. Well, I'm sorry. I'll <laughs> say arse and MILAB, and you can say MILAB. I'm going to say MILAB because it stands for military abduction. Military abductions, yes, yeah. yeah, right. So thank you for letting me talk about it. And going back to having some fear and uncomfort, I'm experiencing some right now uh, because it's the first time I'm talking about it in public. And it's a little hard because it's, uh, I've had, some people don't even believe it's happening. Uh, I believe it's happening. I believe those of us who have come in contact with ETs and have been given information the government knows who we are, and the government uh, debriefs us. Now, I don't quite... I have to say, if you are meeting beings from other dimensions or worlds, isn't it right and proper that the military or the government is holding you in for a checkup? It's been argued. Do you think that's the correct and right way to do it, or are they doing it the wrong way? Are they being it rough-handed? I think they have every right to ask me what I've learned or what I've been told, but why can't they just call me or send me a nice letter or send me a nice email and we can set up an appointment and I'll go and I'll face them. And why does it have to be in this scary way? I'm not even, I, I, I'm not even quite sure what the government is capable of. Are they, are they even capable of getting into my head? Are they capable of having an interdimensional relationship with me or are my, are my memories and interdimensional uh, experience that I've had with these government men or are they in 3D where they came and got me and, and I have no memory of being taken at all? I, I don't know. I can't answer those questions. What do you think? Which government? There's the secret government. There's the cabal that, that's running the show and then there's the so-called elected governments. I don't know, Miles. All I can tell you is... Uh, Every single, there's many, I have many conscious memories. Some of them are okay, and a couple of them are not okay. A couple of them were very, very upsetting. So it's a mix. And each time, have I ever talked about that? I want to do, do that now. I'll talk about, I'll talk about, well, I'll start off talking about one, and then we'll see if I'm in the mood to talk about it, the others. Uh, there's one, uh, uh, I, this is the first time I'm talking about it publicly. I did tell Grant Cameron about it one time when we were just having a chit chat and I didn't expect to tell him, but it just came out and I told him and he validated it for me. And that was like a big deal to me. So I have a memory and I actually drew pictures of it, of, uh, being in this office like space downstairs. And, uh, it felt like governmental because all the colors are muted and um, it's just like really simple desks and there were men there. The men are always young, like in their 30s, and they're all wearing the same clothes, like a simple shirt and pants and just a very drab color with short hair. And I'm finding the pictures that I drew. No, nothing. Nothing. So triangles. The hair? The triangle with the flat top <laughs> and the pointed down. No. In any of that anywhere? No. No. Mm -mm. And so I have a picture here of the room I was in. And then I also have this memory of in that room, there was this uh, big poster or this big uh, picture of the flight path of a spaceship. And along with it, at different points of the flight path of the spaceship were uh, mathematical equations and physics, physics equations. And I can't remember what they were. But I was looking at this big poster or this big picture, and there was one of those young men standing next to me. And he asked me, I wrote it down. Does the saucer attain the K point before or after it conducts its visitation? And, and then after that, I don't remember anything. And so I've Googled K-Point, and it's a real thing, which I still don't understand. I've never heard of K-Point before. 
And I told Grant this story, and then he sent me uh, an article written about an experiencer who was being taught about the K-point from uh, ETs. And it was then I realized, okay, this is real. Like, I can't make this up. I can't make a key point. And uh, the other memories that I have, uh, they're, they're intense. Like every cell in my body can feel them. They're real. They're not dreams. Uh, now... I do have one memory, I don't know if I'm ready to go into the entire thing about it, but where I was, um, I would say mentally tortured. I was mentally tortured. Because uh, the government either wanted me to tell them something or they wanted me to do something, but what they wanted me to do was more like a, a mind thing, and I wouldn't do it. Uh, because I realized that it was going to result in something bad, something ugly, maybe even some deaths. And I didn't want to do it. So there were... What How so? Mean? Yeah. What sort of thing? I don't know the specifics. But I just knew that whatever information they were trying to get from me, they were going to use for bad. It was not going to be um, to promote life. Or it wasn't going to be to help. Uh, I got the feeling that people were going to die from it. And I didn't want to tell them. And so they mentally tortured me. They showed me a few things. Uh, and the violence was involved. It's okay. Go with your heart and how you want to say this, if you want to say and, Thank you. And, and because I had this profound reaction to it, this real emotion to it, that's how I know that it's not my imagination and it's not a dream. So I just allowed them to continue with this mental torture, this visual torture. They were showing me something horrible. And then they came and they said they were going to do the same thing to me. Oh, how nice. And uh, I'm like, do it. Because I'm not going to tell you. And they didn't do it. And I felt like at that moment they realized, even when they were going <clears> to <throat> do this ultimate torture to me, that it wasn't enough for me to tell them. So... I also have memories of speaking with these men where they were nice and they were actually sharing information with me. Uh, they were giving me handbooks about various ET races and they were teaching me things and they were asking me questions. And then I have another one that were, uh, there was uh, an attempted rape, but it didn't happen. And so it's mixed. And thank you for letting me come out and say it. I have heard the stories of other people, uh, men and women, who have MILAB experiences, and I personally believe them to be very true. Uh, um, and, and I think that's all I want to say. Okay. Can you shed light on it? Pardon? Can you shed any light on it? Well, yeah, we've got a bunch of SOBs running the show, running the planet, uh, secret space program. Have you heard of that? Yes. And what have you heard on the secret space program? Oh, just what's on TV. I don't know any. Yeah. Well, there's all sorts of political things going on uh, right now and uh, promises of certain things happening, like arrests, but whether that's got anything at all to do with uh, that military situation. Um, the late Bill Tompkins was going to speak all about what the Navy's done and he was told he could say everything but obviously that was just just a rouge but have you heard of anything in, in the, the, the darker side involving I'm going to call it human trafficking all ages yes can you tell us what you know about that oh no I don't know anything about it I've just heard about it 
I think that's enough unpleasantness for, for one time. Nice to see you smile again. Thank you. Um, I really think I need to get it out in order to move forward and process it. And then maybe this might be my next course of endeavor to, to maybe dig deeper into it and, and illuminate that it's happening. I know there are other people who are doing the work, the MILAB work, uh, other well-known people who are involved in it and who are shedding light on it. Well, um, it's, uh, as we say, uh, I say arts and you say Milab. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I think that's, we can, we can sort of wind that uh, up. I think we've, we've got your beautiful photograph there. Uh, Basis 96 Live, part one, and uh, you're doing very well. And uh, it's great. We'll sort of top and tail this and do a couple little things on it. Finally, any last thing you want to sort of say good night to about any anybody you want to sh do a shout out to, like or, or anything like that. Well, to you, thank you for all the work that you do uh, and all the light that you're shedding on on everything. Uh, I'm very grateful for you uh, and and uh, and. I'm just eternally grateful for my friends and Patrick and Kathy Martin and Grant Cameron who have been with me from the start and that have held my hand and helped me. And I, I want to help others too. So if, if you need some help processing your ET stuff, um, please contact me. Okay. And we'll put the website up and uh, I think that's probably enough for now. So good to see you, Sev. Is that right? And. Uh, Good night, and may your, may your God bless you. Thank you, Maya. Oh, I'm going to do a thing called Fade the Black.